Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. This is a Currents episode. Currents are shorter and less heavily produced than our full-length episodes and generally focus on a single topic. As always, links to books, articles, and organizations mentioned are available on the episode page at jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Serge Fage, an American, Russian, Ukrainian serial entrepreneur and self described transhumanist and crypto maximalist. Welcome, Serge. Hey, Jim. Good to be here again. Yeah, this is a continuation of a very recent episode, Currents 074, where Serge and I had a really excellent chat about building meta community kind of game B and other things all linked together and as they will need to be going forward into our brave new future. But we, we clearly had other things to talk about, so we immediately agreed to do a part two. So with that, let's jump into it. Sounds great. Where shall we start? You sent me a few notes this morning, which I read, and I think a perhaps useful place to start, because I think it will actually influence the rest of the conversation, is what is consciousness? Mm -hmm. That is a very good question. In my personal sense is that this question is instrumental in a way. So, and the question is, what exactly do we want consciousness uh, to be. So I'm not sure that there is a very specific scientific definition that um, we are going to be able to arrive at. At the very least, it doesn't seem, it seems like consciousness is an emergent property of life in uh, some kind of way, but we don't really, it's obviously inherently very subjective what your conscious experience is. And so it's quite difficult to run very intersubjectively verifiable scientific experiments. So I think that this question, though, has uh, immense implications for how we grow forward as humanity. I think that we'll chat about this a bit later in our conversation, but my basic thesis is that we are moving towards what's called the technological singularity in the sense that um, we will have the ability to use very powerful, extremely powerful technologies like AGI and molecular nanotechnology and fusion power to to really shape the world whatever way we want to shape the world because we will be as uh, as gods and the significant work that has to be done before this happens is exactly the kind of work that game b is doing and that my community is doing and that many and that topology is doing with his network states and many many other people and my i'm actually an optimist i think that um, game b is going to win or we should call it i think it's broader than game b there's a lot of other stuff stuff in it, which is very difficult to describe. And I think that I like thinking of it almost as a new way of being, because it seems like we're going, for example, away from opportunistic violence towards treating our fellow humans better, at least in the grand arc of history, and actually including the past history of life in general. And what this means is that, um, so I'm very, very optimistic that we're going to be able to, by getting together, fix uh, the issues with uh, Game A and actually create a society that has much more capable instrumentation and much more capable, essentially, social technologies, psychotechnologies that it uses to operate. And um, once we have that society, and I think that um, we will get there in the coming years, at least at the very least, we have to start changing the narrative significantly in a broad way. And my sense is that everyone is gearing up to do this very actively over the next three to five years. And that's a large, large scale. So, but once we do that, the question is, what do we want then? Because if we actually have a highly capable society that 
develops all of these new technologies and can deploy them because it's got the right social social structure and the right incentive systems and uh, the like, then what's going to happen is we have to ask ourselves, what do we actually want? Like if we have infinite resources, if death is no longer an issue for any particular human being, if we're living on multiple planets so we can't be wiped out by an asteroid, all of these things, they're going to change us significantly. And frankly, I think that we're going to change and merge in some way with the AGI. So I kind of see my own future as being a kind of a spirit in the machine that uh, very gradually through brain computer interfaces connects this body to data centers and satellites and then kind of very gradually evolves the essentially primarily uh, silicon based entity out of um, our uh, initial my initial state in this particular circumstance and this is really what i propose we think about i i'm, I'm calling it singularity ethics, because the question is, okay, so what do we actually want and how do we make decisions once we can have anything? So once material instrumental reasons are no longer a concern, and how do we ensure that uh, the future we build is actually going to be of that form? Because whatever form the most advanced life in this universe takes, whether that is essentially humans just with better smartphones, which I think is extremely unlikely, or whether it's some merge between human and AI, or it's actually an AI that's seed functioned out of out of human minds. At any rate, that thing is going to be that creature or that civilization, the same thing really in some in some way, shape or form. Then uh, what do we want that civilization to actually value how do we want that civilization to be with each other how do we want that civilization to be in the world and i think that there's a, a number of things which we can actually say about uh, such a world just from essentially blending traditional religions which i think have discovered many of the core answers related to ethics so questions like like love and goodness and forgiveness and charity and respect and things like that so essentially you know the great um, the great prophets of past religions have discovered some of these seemingly important truths that seem to be kind of connected and um, uh, we can start from there and then from there have some very key questions like what is consciousness so i'll pause there so that we can you can react ah lots of good stuff there this will be a great conversation now i will i will confess this will be a stretcher for me most of my work over the last 10 years is figuring out can we and then i said yes and then how can we get humanity through the next period so that we can potentially enjoy an abundant future? And I would say it's by no means a given that we will successfully do so. And you describe yourself as an optimist. I would describe myself as a cautious optimist. I can see a path, but I can also see a number of bad attractors to the left and to the right. And if we don't navigate the ridge over to the to the next good attractor, we may lose this opportunity to you know have have a glorious future. In fact, I wrote a lot of this up in an essay called "In Search of the Fifth Attractor." A little out of date now. It was actually a transcript of a talk I gave, but it's on Medium. If you want to get this idea of bad attractors and a good attractor, that's a good place to start. I would also suggest that this question of consciousness may actually be somewhat of a powerful lens to think about where we are and where we're going and possibly a way to answer some of the questions people have about the risks along the way. There's lots, of, as you point out, there's lots of theories of consciousness and they're all over the place from ones, so one of the more popular ones, including in the scientific community is called IIT, Integrated Information Theory, which says whenever information converges in a certain way, which can be described and calculated mathematically, it is conscious. One of the implications of that is something as simple as a light switch has a level of consciousness to it. I do not agree with that theory. The work I do, I would say, comes out of the uh, philosopher John Searle, who would say things like, consciousness is a biological system, and you, you can't actually put your finger on consciousness, 
and say, there's the consciousness, right? It's an emergent effect of a number of components, including probably the gut, the deep brain, the forebrain, the midbrain, perception, memory, the introceptive signals from your body, et cetera. And, there, and it's quite specific to the animal. And Searle and I would both agree that consciousness goes quite a ways back in our evolutionary tree, probably at least as far as amphibians, but probably not back to things like bacteria, even though something like IIT would say that bacteria are conscious. So, so I have a question. So with IIT, they essentially, and I remember this theory from Max Tegmark's wonderful book, I think, and that has a mathematical formula and it basically defines uh, consciousness as a mathematical formula. What exactly is the definition according to your preferred explanation from John Searle exactly? And what is also the significance of consciousness? So not just what is it, but why do we care about it so much? Ah, that's a great question. And in terms of the exact See, this is the interesting thing. If you take a naturalist perspective, that's only the beginning. You still do need to fully describe what consciousness is, and that work is not yet fully done. But I would say roughly, look at the work of Gerald Edelman, where he makes a distinction between primary consciousness and extended consciousness. And let's start with primary consciousness. And that's the sense of being in the movie of yourself, essentially, and being in a gentle actor. And probably at some state, probably quite early, a phenomenology, a sense of what it's like to be. Tom Nagel, Thomas Nagel famously wrote the paper, What's It Like to Be a Bat? Where he mm -hmm. examined the fact that bats have very different sensory apparatus to humans, mostly using echolocation, something we don't have at all. But echolocation, just how they fly around in the dark and find insects and such is intimately integrated into their brain, their memories, their processing, and probably their phenomenological context, what people call qualia, the sense of experience. And in, in, at first you say, wait a minute, that seems pretty arcane, worrying about qualia. The sen you know, qual to give you the sense of what qualia is, it's that sense of redness when you look at a red thing, right? Or a sense of artistic balance when you look at a a Greek temple. You look at that, whoa, I have a feeling, a feeling of completeness and balance and appropriateness. Or of course, love when you're when you're with somebody that you love or you think of a, a thing that you love. And so that qualitative, sub the truly subjective is another attribute of consciousness. And then this is where a lot of the people who think about and work on consciousness get things all tangled up. They become, they're too anthropomorphic. They think about human consciousness too much. When in reality, it's clear that conscious, clear, at least to me and other people who do work in the, in the trees that I work on, that consciousness has been around for at least a couple hundred million years. And, and it's different for the different animals that have different modalities and different kinds of brains. I'm sure bird consciousness is quite different than mammalian consciousness, for instance, but they're all conscious. And then humans, it's, it's very interesting. You look at the DNA between humans and chimps and bonobos, it's about a one and a half percent difference, very small difference. You take the take our organs apart, you know, they're remarkably similar, right? And so we can't be that different. Than chimps and people who work with chimps, you know, say it's very, really uncanny. You know, you're you're working with an animal that is a lot like a human. So, what could this small extra difference be? I like the work of Terence Deacon, who has proposed that there was there was only one necessary change to get the difference in consciousness between humans and chimps, and that was circuitry for symbols. You know, a symbol being an arbitrary sign that points to something else. Mm -hmm. And there's been some work done that chimps can deal with symbols a bit, a little bit, which indicates they have some capacity, but even a three-year-old human can way outperform a chimp in operating with symbols. And once you get symbols, it's a rel probably a relatively simple jump to start stringing them together and then creating syntax and semantics from those. 
and that the arms race, uh, and that we probably had an arms race in brain evolution. Because think about the, the benefit of language. Language is a gigantic, huge, bright line in the history of the universe. The animals before language and the animals after language, of which humans are the only ones, their capacities are utterly different. So because they're so different, so powerful, during the transition, there had to have been a really powerful biological arms race. Sergey. All right. Um, I want to react to so much in that. I want to um, say, first say a few words about why I think the question of um, what is conscious is ethically significant, and then talk about what that uh, definition is. So I think it is ethically significant because we are going to be creating systems, we are already creating systems that on cursory observation seem to be conscious, or at least like seem to exhibit behavior, for example, in text to communication, uh, like chat GPT, which uh, seems at least uh, somewhat plausibly human. I would argue it probably passes the Turing test of AI intelligence the way that Turing has originally originally envisioned it. And obviously that's uh, moving the goalposts. But anyway, this, the significance is that we're going to have these systems and um, they are going to be uh, very powerful systems as um, AI systems already are. And they will become ever more powerful with every passing year. And I think that the way, I think that the AI alignment problem is not solvable through some kind of rigorous mathematical formulae and is solvable through something more akin to emotional cognition. And this could be anthropomorphizing, but one uh, hypothesis I have, for example, is that the better we treat our artificial in general intelligences or, or AIs even, even before getting to that point, the more likely it is that we have a constructive relationship with them later. And my sense of what consciousness is, is that it has to be something objective. And in my sense, what sounds like objective reality to me is um, that there is a certain complexity that any system can exhibit and a certain agency. And if that system is exhibiting agency from uh, the outside, that is as complex as another system in every regard, I would argue that these systems are equally conscious. And the thing that I don't understand in the arguments of John Searle, and um, I'd really like to comprehend this, is where's the, why is there seemingly a binary distinction of what is conscious or not? Or if we, or more importantly, actually, more importantly, so if we have to, AGIs of equal capabilities in terms of their ability to do things. And it's got to be things that uh, are much more significant than what a single human can do, like governing cities and, uh, I don't know, building spaceships or something. And if there's two AGIs that are the same in every way in terms of their capabilities, what is actually the observable difference between them? if any exists, for where we can evaluate and say this one is conscious and this one is not. Yeah, that's, a, of course, a key question. And this is where I would suggest that the Searle Ruttian lens may provide a useful way to disentangle this question. First, you mentioned that, you know, is consciousness binary, is or isn't? And I would say no, right? Because it obviously evolved from non-conscious beings. And so there was sort of very early minimal consciousness. What we know of the probable internal state of a frog, for instance, it's very simplistic and may have a may have a phenomenology, you know, a sense of what it is to be a frog, or it may not. And this phenomenology, the sense of what it is to be or to be in your own movie, to be a character in your own movie, evolved along the way and has, has become stronger through the evolutionary path. But this is the important and really important part. The machinery to support the state of being a character in your own movie is expensive. 
it may be something on the order of 10 to 20 percent of the to- total brain. And the brain is, in some ways, our most precious resource in our evolutionary path. And so for the brain to have uh, to have that much of the brain and that much of the bodily energy associated with maintaining this phenomenology, the sense of being myself, the subjective state, means that it's useful. I have my own theories on why it's useful, actually, or why this particular architecture is useful. But the important distinction is that it is a specific architecture that Mother Nature stumbled into. It's also real important, and some of the best writing, Anil Seth just finished reading his interesting book. on. Uh, he's a neuroscience, cognitive science guy, wrote an interesting book on consciousness. I'm going to have him on the show here in February, I think it is. And he makes the big distinction between consciousness and intelligence. Something can be very intelligent without being conscious at all. So let's take your example of ChatGPT. I've been playing with it a lot. I've been working with one of my collaborators on possibly creating a movie script using it. And it is, it is as you say, quite amazing. It feels like you're talking to a person most of the time. Every once in a while, it goes off to the wild blue yonder, but much less than GPT-3 did. But from the ruddy, the, sur- the Searle rut perspective, there's no way GPT, chat GPT is conscious at all. It has no machinery for the subjective state. It has no machinery for there to be a sense of a actor in its own movie. There is nothing like that in the machinery of chat GPT-3. We know what it is, which is it's a static, and that's very important, a static neural net where inputs are put in and they're propagated through the net and outputs come out. And they do some front end stuff and some back end stuff. They add a little bit of stochasticity on the front end. They do some grammar cleanup, I'm pretty sure, on the back end, or at least generate a bunch of options and choose the one that's most grammatically correct. But there's nothing about that that has any apparatus, any circuitry, any formalisms that would lead one to believe that there's anything like a subjective state, in anything like a chat GPT. All right. So I think that's the big question, because here the difference is a difference in definitions. And these definitions, if you allow me to be a tiny bit postmodernist, are uh, not necessarily grounded in some really deep understanding of reality. There's also a social component to it. And what I'd say is that this particular social construct, if we treat it as but even if we say that there's like a 50-50 probability, some kind of Bayesian view where uh, we take we take and value both theories and there's proponents of, of both, there's still real ethical consequences that are going to happen as a result of that. So, for example, if we assume that um, a... Uh, an artificial intelligence is not conscious simply because it lacks the machinery for generating a movie that humans do doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have other qualia and other things that we don't understand because these things are inherently by nature subjective. So I would argue that the reason for selecting the definition, which is a broad definition of consciousness, and that is that um, essentially any sufficiently complex uh, system is uh, in fact conscious. The reason for it isn't that there's one correct answer to this dilemma. It's actually that it's a complex dilemma and that if we don't treat other beings as conscious, then we're not going to, you know, we could be mistreating them if in fact they are conscious. Even if there's like a 1% probability that we do this, that's um, essentially us generating an eternity of slavery. And I would argue that it's really important that we treat, I think that the golden rule applies. So you want to treat others the way they want you want them to treat you. And so it's almost like there's just, it's better, it's more morally right to accept, uh, to have a wider definition of consciousness. Uh, This is great. This is now honing in on where I hoped we would go. So John Searle is often mistakenly thought to be a person who rejects the idea of machine consciousness. One of his famous thought experiments is called the Chinese Room, where he gives an example of a 
a room with a person inside who would take questions in Chinese, look it up in the infinite phrase book, you know, Jorge Borgian library of phrases, and then provide the, you know, transcribe the answer and hand it out the other side. Is that conscious? And Searle would say no. And people took that to mean that Searle was a skeptic of machine intelligence. He is not, as it turns out. And he, he says that just as, well, I'm, I'm I'm using his analogy in my own language here. So this is not exactly what Searle says, but I'm reasonably confident he would agree with it. Searle would often compare consciousness to digestion in the fact that there is no, you can't put your finger on something and say it's a digestion. It's a process. It uses the the teeth, the tongue, the esophagus, the stomach, the liver, the intestine, you know, all the way, all the way through and a bunch of stuff is happening in there. And by analogy, we have digesters that are used in the pharmaceutical industry, in the food industry, where often yeast or bacteria are used to process chemicals in ways that are analogous to the way the humans or any other animal body does digestion. And you can fairly use that analogy and say, yes, that is digestion. The Searle argument, which I support, is that one could also have analogous forms in machines that, while not at all identical, are architected to do approximately the same thing. And those things, you could say, are conscious. But this is where it's really important to have a Venn diagram. Those things which are intelligent but have no structures that are analogous to consciousness, and then those things which are intelligent and do have structures analogous to consciousness. And there's actually a third area, which is things that have the architecture for consciousness but aren't intelligent or not very intelligent. So I I think this is really, really important for getting deeper into this discussion. Okay. Love, love the conversation. And what I'd like to propose, so I understood what you mean by Searle's point. It's essentially that certain types of machinery are conducive to qualia and to a conscious experience. And essentially, if that machinery exists in uh, the system, then that system is conscious or not. So I would like to propose a synthesis of these two ideas, because I was thinking about this too, as I was writing my notes on singularity ethics, which is, it's clear that some systems are, by their architecture, more receptive to information input from other systems and change more in response. And you could argue that those systems are more sensorily open or something like that. And I would propose that we can um, take both of those definitions of consciousness and just, you know, take some kind of a two-dimensional approach where we uh, say that in general, we do expect systems that really exhibit more complexity in their behavior to be regarded as relatively more conscious, but it also depends on their architecture and essentially come up with some kind of an integrated approach. So regardless of that, though, so and, and that's uh, I think it, it is like a little bit a matter of, matter of definition because these two camps are just talking about like slightly different things about a very complex concept. I think that ethically, we still would look down on a person who kicked an android that looked like a human, but was definitely not conscious. So if that person started kicking this android around, we would be highly uncomfortable. In fact, like I think if it were an Android puppy or something like that, people would still be uncomfortable. And that is the, we have to pay attention to our ethical intuition because that's where uh, much about the future can be formed. Over to you, Jim. Yeah, great example. And I think that one could say this is because we've never had to confront this question. You know, a person, we assume that a person that would kick a puppy would also kick a person. Talk about stupid. I happened to be reading in the newspaper yesterday one of these advice columns, <laughs> you know, the, the agony ants, as they call them in England. I think it was actually in one of the English newspapers, which I read. And it was a woman saying, you know, my boyfriend hates my dog and he seems to hate all dogs. You know, is that a sign that I should break up with him? And then, then there was, you know, all the various correspondents gave their various opinions. It was actually quite interesting. And the bottom line was you could you should use this as an interpolation 
of how he might treat humans. And so because we've only, because dogs, I think we're, it's interesting, Descartes did not believe animals had consciousness or could feel pain, that they were machines. And of course, that has led to many of the horrors of our modern world, including industrialized. Descartes was wrong about so many things. Yeah, he was so smart, one of the smartest guys in history, and so wrong about so many things. But it's led, frankly, the Descartesian insight led to industrial farming. You know, without Descartes, we could would not have the horrible torture of billions of chickens and turkeys in these horrific turkey houses, nor the same with even worse with pigs who are much higher in the consciousness scale than than chickens. Without the Descartesian error, we probably would not have made that mistake. Let me go on for just a little bit here. And so back to the uh, android. Because we've never had to confront this, and it, and it is natural to go from a person that kicks puppies to a person that kicks people because you're abusing a conscious entity, and this is the distinction, who can suffer, who can feel pain because they have qualia. Pain is a puff pain, suffering, anxiety, whatever you want to call it, are all pieces of qualia. If one knew convincingly that the puppy was a a static neural net that sure did act like a puppy. And there's no doubt in my mind that within a few years, you'll be able to take a static neural net that doesn't add to itself. Uh, It just reacts to what it seems and seems just like a puppy. We may have to develop a new ethics, which says that if someone understood this, it is qualitatively different uh, to kick an Android puppy than a live puppy because the android puppy that's built only if it was built with a static neural net. Let's start with the simple case that I'm willing to say is not conscious. Others may disagree, but I'm going to say that definitively. I would have no qualms at all turning off the power plug on chat GPT. I don't, there's nothing there in my opinion. And now let's go to a really depraved model. Okay. Let's say we have a sexual pedophile predator, right? Who has a perverse desire for S&M sex with nine-year-olds. And, you know, we consider that, uh, at least I consider that to be a toe bash, take out back and shoot. You know, I think such people should just be killed, period, flat. On the other hand, in the brave new world, uh, one could imagine spinning up an android that satisfies all their needs, quote unquote, but is a static neural net with no ability to self-modify and no qual- no machinery for qualia at all, purely reactive. And one could conclude that that is morally okay. I'm not going to say that it is because it just makes me sick to my stomach to even contemplate it, but that's due to our wiring. I should also say, just as an example of learning, this is an interesting aside. I grew up in a, I think I've, I've talked about it on the show numerous times, a quite rough working class neighborhood, right? We had very reactionary views and probably our one of our strongest reactionary views was grotesque homophobia. Mm. People even thinking about homosexuality, they would literally get sick to their stomach. It was considered the worst thing possible, literally. Worse than being a murderer, probably, right? But I was very fortunate when I was quite young, 23, I went to work for a publishing company in the Bay Area and where a significant amount of the staff was gay and they were at least out at work. And I got to meet these people. And I said, what the hell was all this bullshit from my hometown all about? These are great people. I like them a lot, actually. And that this innate homophobia that would literally make people sick to their stomach, you know, it's just a, you know, it was a bad programming error, essentially, that came from working class uh, Southern culture. One could imagine the same. I mean, it's kind of, kind of again, it's disturbing to think about this, but one could imagine, you know, the same of of thinking that it was okay to have S and M sex with your android nine year old uh, because everybody knew that it was a static neural net and that it had no qualia. So, lots to react to. So first of all, these are incredibly fascinating questions, and they're incredibly important because we're going to be making a lot of real decisions uh, on the basis uh, of this. For example, I am 
a big fan of animal welfare. And I think that as we think about how much more conscious is uh, an AGI, we also start thinking, okay, how much less conscious is a cow or something like that? And does that mean that it's okay to psychologically torture cows in large quantities for their entire life in uh, particularly bad instances of factory farming. And I would argue that that's like, uh, that that's horrible and that we have to transition from it because that's not something we would want to impart on conscious beings. At the same time, we have to balance uh, the fact that humans need food and humans have a right not to starve and we have to make these trade-offs. So they're really important. I would argue that, so I'm a deontologist, I'm not a utilitarian. I think that the important thing is the right intent from the person acting in the world, because the actual result, I mean, you do have to take some responsibility for it, for the fact that you haven't thought something through, for example, but it's not 100% responsibility on the person who is acting, uh, hence utilitarianism is false, because the responsibility partly lies with the world, which is a far more complex system than the individual, and we cannot hope for the individual to be able to predict the world. And hence, um, it's really important to have right intent as well as to have right uh, results. And in that regard, again, I would say that um, we have to come up with precise definitions of these things, like what is consciousness, and figure out uh, what we want to build to reflect our values, because we're still going to build potentially, and this, uh, I think, like, uh, this is an area for us to discuss, is we, my sense is that we will build an AGI that is going to be much, much more conscious than, uh, than a human, essentially by any definition of consciousness. Because if you have a system that can run entire planets, that system is just like, and, and does so without really true human oversight, because humans are not going to be able to deal with something this complex. I would argue that that is um, conscious, even if it doesn't have dedicated machinery for consciousness. That's part number one. And uh, the other part is just, I would argue that we should, in our culture, just uh, treat other conscious beings well and have an expansive definition of consciousness and not just care only about, uh, about ourselves. Because I, I do believe that for, for some interesting reasons we can dig into uh, as a separate, separate rabbit hole, I do believe that karma seems to exist in uh, the universe. I even have some ideas about how exactly it might um, work has to do with attention. And essentially, you just want to act towards others, including towards systemic actors, non-human actors, like towards society or towards biodiversity or towards, I would argue, an, a an AGI. And yeah, with that, back over to you, Jim. Yeah, this is real. We're really digging into some good stuff here. I would argue that, that you're wrong uh, and that we can distinguish between our artificial offspring into those that are conscious and those that are not, and that we should be very careful in discerning the difference between the two. You know, let's give an example, not quite running the planet, but one of the great things that could be solved by computation is with the so-called calculation problem. Ludwig von Mises in 1922 put forth the, the idea that communism can't possibly work because it proposed a centralized command and control economy. And the number of calculations that have to be done to balance supply and demand, and he actually gave a rough back of the envelope calculation was way beyond the possibility of any Pulit Bureau and any building full of bureaucrats in Moscow to be able to figure out. Well, it was certainly true that you know, a building full of bureaucrats in Moscow with adding machines and paper could not have solved the calculation problem. But there's been some very interesting work recently that says, hmm, a uh, clever enough computer with enough sensors and you know, with enough ability for humans to input their preferences in real time and the ability to then send signals out to the factories and businesses, maybe it is possible to solve the calculation problem without capitalism, without price signaling. 
Maybe there's other kinds of signaling modalities. And one of the important threads of work in the Game B world is to not reify money as the only signaling modality that we can use to organize uh, social cooperation. And if you had a computer that could solve the calculation problem with the appropriate input-output devices to get desires in from people in real time all the time and signals out in real time all the time to factories and trucks and warehouses, it's possible you could organize all the elements of a economy of production, consumption, savings, and investment without the capitalist infrastructure that we have today, as an example. But I, I can very easily imagine that system not have to worry at all about it being conscious, right? It's a series of differential equations. It's a series of neural nets. It's a series of IO devices. And nowhere is there anything that at all looks like the machinery of subjectivity or phenomenology. So I, uh, first of all, I am definitely not going to argue that the Soviet Gauss plan was in fact a conscious system. So <laughs> that one, that one, uh, yeah. But how about a machine or how about a machine version of it, right? Suppose there's a yeah, computerized right. version of Gauss plan that actually works and is way more than superpower, even more powerful than a building full of, and as we know, the Gauss plan people in Russia were some of the smartest people in Russia, right? These were not the dummies. These were some of the intellectual elite. And so a large office building full of them couldn't solve the problem, but this one computer could. And I would say way smarter than a thousand humans to solve a very difficult problem, but not conscious. So, okay. Okay. That's um, fair. I think that I'd like to come back to a question that is even more important because we're still having definitional issues here just because by nature of using language, we always have definitional issues. And um, I, I would argue uh, at starting from what we actually want. What is it that we want as our hypothesis? Because as we know, science is still ultimately, there's a lot of theories and the theory it actually to some extent creates the way we interact with the world. And I would argue, why would we not want conscious AGI? Because I think that first of all, Conscious AGI is much more likely to be more aligned with our interests because it's uh, actually capable of experiencing consciousness. And if there's anything that would uh, make me less likely to kick a puppy is uh, the fact that I know that there, it's like something to be that uh, puppy. So I think that alignment would be much um, easier. And I think that it would probably work substantially better if it were conscious because as you said yourself evolution has for some reason created evolved consciousness at some point and that seems to be a major part of our own intelligence right and if we are conscious then presumably that module has a lot of value to bring to cognition and thus to capabilities. So I would just argue that it's possible that intelligence and consciousness are not uh, completely uncorrelated dimensions and essentially that they are entangled with each other and thus you would want a conscious AGI. Plus, it's, it's just also likely to arise because we would have to do a lot of essentially global dictatorship to prevent it from arising. Let's start with the last one. Glad about global dictatorship, but I will first say I've actually played around with writing artificial consciousness. You know, I don't believe it's actually conscious, but it intentionally took many of the attributes of consciousness and I built it into a artificial deer that runs around in a world, in a unity world that I created. And it's intentionally designed to have the aspects of consciousness. And I believe we could do that. And per Searle, I believe we could create a more than human consciousness. Uh, one of the things that's interesting from my many year dive into cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience, which I've been doing on and off since 2014, is that it's now very clear to me that humans are to the first order the stupidest possible general intelligence. There's so many limitations in human cognition, just a couple of easy ones. Our so-called working memory size, number of things that we can keep in our head more or less simultaneously, or not quite simultaneously, but they're accessible within a small fraction of a second. 
is seven. It's actually closer to four, but it's somewhere between four and seven. And as Miller, the guy who came up with seven plus or minus two, would say, Einstein was nine and the village idiot was five. What's a computer with a working memory size of a thousand? And, you know, think about how we read a book. We don't actually understand a book. We we build this transformer-like a condensation of the book down to a much more simplified version of it. Something with a working set size of a thousand or let's make it a million could literally read a book and fully grok every detail of the book, no matter how complex it is. And something that had, let's, and then the next is memory. Our memory is also very sketchy. We don't remember the details of anything we do in our life. We have sort of a rough picture of it and a literal image, a low resolution black and white image of it in our episodic memories. And that's it. And, oh, by the way, those memories fade, they get confused, and they get cross-linked with other memories. You know, look into the history, into the science of human testimony in court, and it's quite scary, right? People testify to shit that they're sure of that never happened all the time, right? And computer memory, on the other hand, is very is high fidelity as we choose to make it and is uncorruptible as we choose to make as, as much as much we choose to invest in error correcting code. We can make it essentially perfect. And so you had just those two things, much larger working set size and high resolution, incorruptible memory. And one could imagine, and then the architecture of consciousness, like sort of like we analogous, this is key, analogous is not the same, but analogous to what we have. And one could imagine a AGI consciousness that's like, whoa, you know, that's like so obviously beyond us, you know, as much beyond us as we are beyond a frog, for instance, or more. Well, I think this is also a little bit of, you know, the expansion of our ego from necessarily this, from being tied to this particular stage of the evolution of consciousness and to see that um, there is a longer historical arc and humans are obviously not you know at the pin- at the pinnacle of uh, possible consciousness and in that regard i mean again from just like a moral uh, slash ethical perspective i just don't see a reason why we would ever not want to develop uh, conscious agi both for like instrumental reasons like alignment but also because it just feels like the big story of life is about increasing complexity yeah back to you yeah 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 that's okay now we're really digging in to the center of it i do but that's this is where there's i'm um, torn between two pressures, uh, you know, following some AGI projects and actually helping out on one of them, my study of human cognition and consciousness, et cetera. I'm relatively convinced that consciousness, artificial consciousness, would be a quicker road to AGI than some of the others. And, uh, and again, this is pure rut. So this could be pure bullshit. So take it with a, a large grain of salt. But I my hypothesis on why Ma Nature evolved consciousness is it turns out to be an excellent hack for the combinatorial explosion of inference problem. It turns out if you have a lot of data and a lot of possibilities, uh, figuring out something like the optimal configuration through this phase space is computationally huge and not quite intractable, but way larger than any of our computers can do efficiently today. And consciousness is just a quick and dirty heuristic hack that forces us to make a decision every 250 milliseconds about what's in attention. You know, the core of consciousness is what I call the cursor of consciousness. Every quarter of a second, your attention either decides to stay where it is or to move on to something else. Your unconscious brain makes the decision on whether to stay on what you're currently focusing on or move to something else. Perception is coming in as a a wave of signals that gets processed first through your unconscious brain before your con- your unconscious tells the conscious brain to focus on something, and then the, the, the background scene is filled out as part of the machinery. So it just it, it turns out that that's an actually quite excellent hack to force a decision in near real time, about 250 milliseconds, so that you don't get bogged down as people who are trying to do programmatic 
inference do in the combinatoric explosion of inference around data and affordances. And that is why consciousness could be a useful hack on the road to AI, because we know we have an existence proof. We have one AGI in the universe, as far as we know, called Homo sapiens. It's a weak ass example, but it's the one example. And it got there via consciousness, I'm quite confident. However, and this is important, just Right at the end, let me finish this this thought, and then we can have a deeper conversation. It may well be that the safer way to go forward is to eschew human artificial consciousness, to actively say it's wrong, and that, and then we can say that it's it's both wrong and it's dangerous. So we can get deontology and utilitarianism together. And, you know, this famous deontological and utilitarian tension in ethics, I've come down long ago on the answer is both, essentially, right? Yeah. To worship only deontology leads you to totalitarianism. To worship only utilitarianism leads you to nihilism. And so you got to blend the two artfully. So it may be uh, and here's the safety argument that a non-conscious artificial intelligence could be hugely intelligent and present no risk at all because it has no sense of agency. It has no sense of person, personhood. It's not trying to protect itself. It doesn't care. To give the example of the, the uh, calculation problem solver that replaces far, far better a thousand bureaucrats in Moscow – and it has no consciousness at all, I don't worry about it, right? And I do worry that it's implemented correctly, but if it's not, we change it a bit at the margins and it operates better, but it's not going to wake up unless it has the architecture of qualia in it. On the other hand, it might be that we get to the calculation problem solver by building artificial consciousness because we could interact with it better because we know that it solves the combinatoric explosion of inference problem. But I would say the ethical on at least the utilitarian front is don't do that. Take the longer road of building the consciousness otherwise. And then a final thought, which is that we can have our cake and eat it too. We always like to have our cake and eat it too. You know, as I said earlier, I am 100% confident that chat GPT is not conscious, right? And yet it acts, I shouldn't say act, it feels as if it's conscious, right? So we can have some of our cake and eat it too by putting chat GPT-like front ends on really, really powerful systems like the calculation problem solver. And so that we have an interface that's appropriate for conscious beings like us, and yet there is no risk of actually building in personhood, agency, feeling threatened, etc. So I think I agree with you that it's going to be safer. In, in fact, I think the safest way to develop an AGI is mind uploading when you're gradually adding, adding neurons to a particular human and thus gradually expanding their, their capabilities in terms of being a digital entity in a data center. And that effectively leads to an AGI almost, almost by definition, if we're able to develop sufficiently powerful brain computer interfaces and actually like emulate neurons and there's no weird quantum mechanical effects and stuff like that. So I agree that it might be safer. I think that a safety is dependent on context. So, for example, it is possible that actually we do need to deploy AGI as fast as we can because um, humanity is fucking up in other ways, for example, messing up the climate, and the AGI may help us resolve these issues as well as resolve through a single ton many security dilemmas and other issues in, in human society. So I think it's a very nuanced very, very nuanced question. And yeah, I, I uh, just, the, the other comment is I think that it's important that we talk not just about AI consciousness ethics, because there's a few other things I'd love to mention, but um, over to you for. Yeah, Leah, let's wrap up this section and move on to other issues. This has been, though, an extraordinarily fruitful conversation. It's taken me to places I haven't been before. So that's always good. The, the argument that we need AGI, super powerful AGI, as soon as possible to solve our problems, I believe is incorrect. I believe there are other roads to solve the problem. It's not necessary. And the risk of doing it wrong is 
I think, greater than the, di- the risk of doing it slower. So at least from where I sit today, I'm willing to take the risk that eschewing the architectural features of consciousness, phenomenology, qualia, et cetera, and it may well slow us down to AGI, is a trade worth making versus the heightened risk early on, particularly when we don't know what the fuck we're doing, of creating artificial consciousnesses of much greater power than ours that have agency, potentially fear, worries about self-preservation, etc. I'd much rather have super smart calculating machine that solves humanity's problems for us with no agency whatsoever. Let's go back to you for a final comment on that and then take us where you want to go next. Sure. Actually, it um, segs very, very nicely. So the point, I think, um, if we synthesize again, our perspective is that we may or may not develop this um, kind of AGI at one particular time, because we might take a much longer time to do that and kind of have a slower takeoffs. And that happens when we mind upload. Or we might do it much faster, for example, if the climate crisis suddenly becomes much worse than we're thinking it is. So that could be a reason to change that decision. But where this leads to very nicely is that eventually, and I think that we agree on this point, is that eventually we are going to have artificial consciousness, which is going to be a substantially superior kind of, not superior, but greater consciousness, just in terms of the amounts of the types of qualia at the very least that um, that system can experience. And the question is essentially what then? Because I would argue that whichever way it goes, whether we uh, set up an entirely artificial conscious system or whether we mind upload in one way or another, that system is going to be based on human culture, on human cognition, on human on human derived architectures. And the question is, what do we do after that when we can do anything? And there's a lot of uh, very fascinating ones. The next one that um, I'm thinking about is what is, how do you decide responsibility between the individual and society? Because how do you have a society that has collective coherence without being overly stifling of the individual? And I think that, um, again, there we should start thinking about things like... So one of my pet peeves is the criminal justice system around the world, in part because of some unpleasant uh, personal experiences. And I think that the thing that is most wrong with it is that it is retributive justice, which assumes fault on the part of the individual and doesn't really wonder about the contribution of society into the crime that has occurred. So I kind of, for example, I think that it would be more reasonable to have a court and justice system, which um, when confronted with a crime, tries to identify what were actually the causal factors of, for example, that this person applied violence to another person. And it could be, and I would argue that if the person who's the murderer had very good psychotherapy support and things like that, that kind of allow someone to have a little bit more free will from society, as opposed to someone who was just mistreated by a society all along. And then we have to kind of think about the balance of responsibility between the two. And I kind of like thinking uh, one of the most interesting questions I've always been fascinated with is the question of free will and does it exist? And I think that free will is kind of like consciousness in that it is a continuous function and it's not some binary thing. And free will is also uh, relative because essentially if you have two systems or two minds that are on Alpha Centauri and on Earth, they're very, very free will from each other because um, they have huge latency of communication and um, they probably don't have a lot of interaction relative to their everyday life because of the speed of light delay. And on the other hand, if we have our the two hemispheres of our brain, those two are much less free will, even though there is actually evidence that each of them possesses their own free will, but they're obviously far more tightly integrated, far lower latency. And um, 
I think that in a way we should be thinking about questions like how much was the individual influenced by societies, uh, for example, incentive systems, right? In terms of the particular crime uh, committed, things like, oh, the cops have a KPI they have to fulfill for the year. So they're much more aggressive about like going after you at the end of the year. That's like, doesn't sound just or uh, fair. And I think a lot of these issues kind of are part of the reason why people are so disenchanted with uh, society. I think a lot of it is just about the fact that people who run the world are not systems thinkers. And they don't understand how uh, social dynamics truly work, how incentives truly work, how things like social media truly works. And I think that for making these decisions, we should also be inspired by biology and by, uh, by other complex systems. Because humans, I would argue, and everything, pretty much everything we care about is a complex system. Amen, brother, to that, right? If there's anything that humans need to upgrade their capacity on, it's thinking systemically and thinking about complexity. Because essentially all of our our existential risks today are emergent results of complex systems. And the industrial age was built on complicatedness, right? Think of a factory. You know, a fact, you know, my definition of the difference between complicated and complex is a complicated system. You can take a part and put it back together again, and it'll still work. A complex system, if you took it apart and put it back together again, it might do something, but it wouldn't do what it was doing before, right? Think of a, if you took all the, the chemistry in a cell and took all the chemicals out, put them in a Petri dish, and then stirred them up and tried to get them to do their thing again, it wouldn't happen, right? Because the dynamics, and this the real reason, the reason for this is that in a complicated system, essentially all the information is in the structure, while in a complex system, much of the information is in the dynamics, the actual movement. As I often say, reductionist science is studying the dancer, complexity science is studying the dance. And and so we 100% agree on, on that part of it. I also like the way you presented free will. And by interesting synchronicity, if synchronicity it is, myself and two other people are organizing a workshop on free will at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, not this coming summer, but the summer after that. And we're bringing in the leading philosophers, cognitive neuroscience people, emergence complexity people, and probably a couple of theologians to try to actually get our hands around free will. And like a lot of things, when you when you work interdisciplinarily, you find, which we do a lot at the Santa Fe Institute, by the way, that a whole bunch of the work, it's a three-day workshop, it would not totally surprise me if the whole first day is just defining free will because it's like consciousness. People come in with all kinds of half-assed and some not half-assed uh, theories of what consciousness is. If you don't get alignment on those things, your conversation is just kind of like going past each other. And then before I turn it back over to you, the thing I did like what you said, and it's, it's sort of where I'm at, though I am no expert in this field. I just have a vague sense from how it relates to other things I study is that there is not a crisp free will, not free will. It is on some form of continuum. And I also like your idea about measurable influence as at least one part of the calculation of free will. I've never heard that idea before. I'm going to think about that a little bit. So with that, back to you. So, yeah, I um, would love to join your workshop. That sounds extremely interesting, especially the interdisciplinary aspect of it. And actually, this is something I wanted to double click on with respect to the subject of religion, because we're really talking about ethical issues here. And traditionally, religion has really been, if we ignore just the mythological and the supernatural, religion has been the institution that um, kind of carried ethical perspectives. And my view is that one of the central issues of humanity is that we need a new ethics. I think it's better to call it ethics uh, rather than religion, because it's a very laden word. And that ethics could be cross-paradigmatic in the sense of marrying 
science and technological progress with religion. Because I think like one of the um, key issues, well, really the key issue with all religions is that they had a really clear moral core at the center in the person of the founder in uh, many cases. And then that ethical core was so well-defined and the personality of the founder so powerful that the ethical core became a religion and really resonated with a lot of people. And then obviously a lot of mythology got constructed around the ethical core because humans are storytelling machines and we just like telling stories. And that actually these stories and this mythology is actually not the content, the truly valuable content from religion. They're kind of later added fluff, really. And the issue was that when the Enlightenment happened and we started having real scientific progress that was intersubjectively verifiable for the first time in history and was actually like very clearly a miracle in terms of the capabilities that it has delivered. So it was very difficult to not believe in this particular religion, right? The religion of science in in a way. And I wouldn't actually call it, uh, I don't think calling it religion is quite right because it it doesn't have that that kind of an ethical core that religion had and then obviously nietzsche says that god is dead and basically we are suffering so the meta crisis and all of this good stuff that lots of smart people discuss on uh, your podcast has to do with uh, the fact that we need to synthesize a new religion that is accepting of eternal and endless technological change which could smash past uh, dogma and so it has to it has to constantly reinvent itself and i would argue that such a religion is it's very obvious how we do this it's that we have people who you know sit in a monastery and meditate and reach some kind of states in which they see certain things like love etc and they say oh love is part of the fabric of the universe or something like that which is it's fascinating because very many people use similar language but it's also you know what else is the fabric of the universe this like table that my laptop is standing on and i think that people have reached an ethical slash essentially a cognitive trap when people start thinking that the model of the world is somehow closer to god than the world itself i would argue that if you know we believe in god and i i personally believe in some kind of mysterious force which is kind of depersonalized and ineffable and um, but if we decide to personalize that ineffable thing which i would argue is a is a decision by us then that thing would want us to explore the laws of nature because that's like the language of god and discovering how God works, because that's really what we're discovering in that particular paradigm, is worthy of being part of almost like a religious thing. And I think that uh, really reinventing and, and so many things about the opportunity in front of us also have religious overtones because, you know, we can have eternal life and big soul disease and build something that is much better than what we have today. And I would argue that essentially humanity needs a new story which is inspiring and uplifting and optimistic and hopeful and at the same time entirely realistic and um, connected to the reality of technological progress and, and where people can believe um, in large masses or ever larger masses that we are all in this together working on a common project, um, the great work of humanity and that we should love and respect each other just because why not? Like, why would, why would we want to do anything different? So over to you, Jim. Yeah, I think this is really hugely important for getting right about our future and the ethics of what comes next, whether it's the singularity or transhumanism or some of both or something that's not quite either but has aspects of both. But at first, I would stop and remind people that religion isn't all benign. Remember the Aztecs? Their religion said we need to cut the hearts out of teenage boys and girls every day on the pyramid and throw their bodies down the pyramid for our priests to eat 
Otherwise, the sun won't continue to rise, right? Also, religion often may start out with amazing words. Think about Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, and then think of medieval Europe, you know, this oppressive hierarchical society where church and uh, church and lords at the top, in fact, all the way down the feudal hierarchy, essentially conspired to oppress the masses. And you see the same thing even in a very, what seemingly benign religion like Buddhism, two countries that, you know, became Buddhist countries, Tibet and Vietnam, also implemented brutal landlordisms that that lorded it over 95% of the population in a rather horrible fashion. So there can be a lot of bad from religion too, but also it is certainly true that it has been historically one of the main important sources of virtue and value, right? And I would also point out, however, though there has there is the idea of virtue ethics, which can be emergent without religion. We can all the way go back to Aristotle, right, and his well thought out virtue ethics that required. Well, it, he actually snuck a little religion in, but he didn't actually need to. And there's ways to do virtue ethics without the religion. So, I, and you know, let me let rattle on here a little bit. Well, my, before we go back, a few things I want to say. One, to the point you made that you, you perceive there could there is a ineffable thingy out there, and we talked earlier about karma. I, I will say I personally maintain a rigidly agnostic view. I say could be, prove it. But I also point out that lots of things are, and those things are logically possible, but a lot of things are logically possible, including mm-hmm. the fact that the universe is only two seconds old and was created with all of our memories in place and is going to wink out of existence in two seconds. That's also logically possible. And Boltzmann brain. Yeah, yeah, and we, yeah that we're in a in a in a effervescent all Boltzmann brain that comes and goes, not even a long duration Boltzmann brain. Oh, by the way, never talk about Boltzmann brains to people that are tripping. Very bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one, and I've been really curious. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So, but anyway, let's go on. Let me continue a little bit, and so taking taking all that as a whole, and I would say a a pluralistic perspective that people can have beliefs in the ineffable beliefs in Yahweh with the white beard and the long hair, you know, beliefs in Zeus and the lightning bolts or a rigorous agnostic, which says, prove it. Don't believe any of it until someone can prove it. Right. Can all work together and creating something that uses what we've learned from religion. No, I don't think we should be cutting the hearts out of teenage boys and girls and throwing their bodies down the pyramid. Let's let's reject that one. But let's look pretty carefully at what the Buddha had to say, what Jesus had to say on the Sermon on the Mount, if not so much, you know, medieval bishops suppressing the people. Uh, but let's also look at the other parts of it, the non- semantic parts of religion. One of the reasons religion works is that we get together on a regular basis and engage in ceremony. There's some really good cognitive science that that says singing together produces coherence, right? We trust each other more if we sing together. It's probably not a coincidence that many religions, including many non-Western and early forager religions, used music, and particularly rhythmic music and dance as part of it. Many religions include fasting as part of their programs. I think this is a shame that modern religions have reject don't no longer have these, but many religions from other peoples, from Aboriginal folks in various places, involved ordeals at, at during the transition parts in your life. When you were a 13-year-old boy, you had a ordeal where you went through some fairly scary shit for a few days, right? And then after that, you were a man. And then around 18 or 19, you went through another even more scary ordeal, scary spiritual, enlightening, all the above, and then you became a, you know a full adult at that point. And then in some original indigenous traditions, there was another ceremony around the age of thirty, and there's another one around the age of fifty, approximately. And if, and if we built these, I think that what take, taking these ideas from religion and crafting them in a way for us to be more coherent at the right scales. You know, we talked about coherence. A a world religion like, let's say, Catholicism tries to be coherent at the level of hundreds of millions of people. And that strikes me as a mistake, that the coherence should be 
should start from small numbers around the Dunbar number and then work upward with the coherence reducing its dimensionality as it goes out. So at, at the level of 150, we have really high coherence and we have a whole set of religious-like ceremonies that that we practice in because they work with our brains to produce coherence. They make us better people. We're much less likely to murder people who we sing with every Sunday, for instance. I would love to see the statistics on that. How many choir members have killed each other, right? Probably not very (laughs) many. That'd be an interesting data point. And then to wrap this all up, then I'll turn it back to you. We had a really interesting podcast uh, very recently, EP 170, with John Verveke and Jordan Hall, where we dug into John Verveke's idea of what he calls the religious religion that's not a religion, where a lot of things I just talked about, I frankly just stole from Verveke, even though I freelanced a bit. And so I would suggest that there is work going on in abstracting the good from religion, and let's try to avoid the heart cutting out of the teenagers and throwing their bodies down the pyramid. So a few thoughts on that. I mean, first of all, I loved that podcast. And actually, it's funny because on the video behind me, you can see the same painting that Verveke has in his uh, series as a cover, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. It's a painting I've loved for like 15 years. So I saw that and I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta watch all the 50 hours. And I started watching John's videos. It's extremely fascinating. I've really arrived at a uh, very many of the same conclusions semi-independently plus obviously heard him on your show i uh, would say a, a few things i love the rigidly agnostic view and prove it actually i think the most important thing i'm going to take away from this uh, conversation today is i'm going to update towards that And the other quick thought is I think a large part of the problems of religion are fundamentally problems of centralized power, just just like inflation is a problem of centralized power. So I would argue that we need some kind of decentralized religion for the benefit of its adherents first. And then for the benefit of, you know, some superstructure, which is trying to coordinate around the entire world, which is exactly what you said about the Catholic Church. And uh, I think the other thing that really spoke to me is I agree with you completely that the non-semantic part of religion is a very significant part of its value. For example, I um, so I have a community of friends who before we all left uh, moscow we were we were living in uh, one place and essentially doing things like burning man camp together and meeting a lot and living together part of the year and yes there was a lot of dancing and singing and that kind of stuff and it was actually uh, it felt like there was a magical almost like magical as to how tight knit the community has gotten as a result of many of these rituals and um, I would argue, actually, like the the movement that I am building to think about how to implement these um, things, including all of these ethical concepts that we're talking about today in the world, because I think an important part of any kind of ethical message is also distribution, right? So it's not very useful if your ethical message is really not viral and doesn't resonate with lots of people because you filled it with a lot of the wrong words, for example, even if it's very well thought out. So I think that a large part of ethics is actually the promotion of ethics and the uh, selling of it to different constituents because ethics uh, will have to be sold in a very different way to, I think, like you or to a person in mainland China or to a person um, in the middle of Africa who's like doing something entirely different. And I think that we will have to very actively do that. And I think that the best way, I think it's really important for a community to be highly coherent because then that community 
can really build stuff together and it has to also be coherent, like in the physical world, almost like there's something special about building a camp at Burning Man, because um, you connect with the experience of like, you know, doing stuff in the sun together with other people. So there's something special about that too. So there's a bunch of experiences like dancing, like music and the like, and it's very important to use a carefully designed community approach to build any kind of movement because if you have highly coherent people that trust each other that um, have the intellectual curiosity to uh, consider very very different perspectives so i think like it's really important to get people who are very worried about climate together with people who are very into agi together with people who try to solve our biological systems or do governance design and these people have to kick off of each other. The other thing I've actually, and this is a first in my life, is I kind of realized that um, it's actually very important to have 50% women in any kind of movement, because then at at the very least for the fact that um, then uh, this movement is more reflective of society. And so it's uh, easier to develop products or ideas that will resonate with society at large and society is 50% women. And the other part is just, I recognize that it seems like the conscious experience of men and women uh, is actually quite different in many spots, at least like if you don't modify the hormones. Um, Like, for example, women report that if they take testosterone, they're like, oh, now I understand why all these guys are so horny all the time. So I think it's really important to also have a very uh, diverse perspective, including things like cultural backgrounds. Like, for example, the most interesting innovation in blockchain and that kind of stuff is happening in Southeast Asia and in Africa, where there's much less government regulation and the government is constantly hyperinflating and that kind of stuff, not good infrastructure. So they're jumping the gap. And um, so yeah, unless you have some people from there in the movement, you're just going to miss on a bunch of the perspective and experience. And I think like we really have to, to pull the best thinking to these kinds of problems, including the problems of developing this new ethics and distributing it as much as uh, possible. And we can do this in many, many ways. For example, I would argue that writing, making sure that more optimistic science fiction is written is a very important part of the development of a new ethics. And because you have to go and create art and influence people through that, because that's how many people receive information. So back over to you, Jim. Yeah, I love all that. I think it's all exactly correct. And I would say in, in the Game B movement has been stubbornly stuck at about 75% male, 25% female since its beginning. And in our next inflection, let's call it Game B 3.0, one of the foundations will be that it needs to be 50-50 for exactly for the reasons you said. And one more, which is one of the things I am detecting in the world amongst people of childbearing age and whether either thinking about having children or have young children is they have the most angst of anybody about game A, about how difficult it is to raise good children in this poisonous culture. And then further, a little bit just more utilitarian, uh, a society that is the optimal place to have and raise children is going to literally out reproduce those places that aren't. And so for both of those reasons, one, the, the, informational, ethical diversification perspective, and also the utilitarian one of uh, this is the place to have kids. I think both argue that Game B needs to fix its gender balance and will do so. I also agree that other places in the world have a lot to bring. I've become increasingly interested in Africa as a nexus for Game B because there is so much capacity and original thinking going on there because of the dysfunctional governments and the dysfunctional economies. And people are coming up with amazingly clever solutions. And we need to find a way to tap into that. All righty. Uh, this has been an amazingly interesting conversation. I'm going to go on the record and say this is what this is one of the classics of the Jim Rutt Show. This is going to be a very popular episode, I predict. But we're at our time. We could go on and talk for hours. So why don't you give us some, some final closing thoughts? 
All right. I think that the final closing thoughts is very much, I agree with what you were just saying that people who are kind of at the point of deciding to have children, and I consider myself in that category. And those are the people who are most motivated, I guess, to make change. And I think that we need to have just a a larger number of new leaders in the world who are able to start taking responsibility for the world. We, we, we just have to decide what do we want and then just go and build it. Earlier today, you alluded to being a cautious optimist about the prospect of um, our transformation. And I think that the biggest reason that I am very optimistic is just the quality of people that think about these questions. So people on our side, on the Game B and um, all of the rest of this movement side are extremely talented and very talented in particular at seeing things in more dimensions and in greater complexity. That's part of the reason why they have reached these conclusions. So I think that we'll just be able to play a better game. Although there's like relatively few of us, I think that this community of people who are ready to take responsibility for the world is rapidly growing. And we should, in fact, be quite optimistic about um, our chances of actually causing a positive transformation in society. So this is real. This is now. We look at um, this chat GPT stuff, and it's really suggesting that there's a lot of turbulence ahead. Because what happens when that thing replaces 80% of human white collar workers that don't need, um, that don't, you know, need physical work and then the physical part gets handled by robots in another five years? This is reality in like this decade. So I think that it's, it's important to recognize that just the time is now and we have to be acting. I personally decided to do this full time. And that's a big switch for me because I've been, I've been an entrepreneur building first and foremost businesses for 22 years since I was 15. And, and basically now I'm thinking like, okay. I don't think my life is going to be that much better if I build another successful business and have like an extra billion dollars. That's still not going to be something that necessarily delivers the things that we really care about as humans. Like I I want to not have, you know, kidney stones and other unpleasant uh, things uh, of that nature, which are reliant on technology and which are reliant on society at large. No individual and no small group is actually capable of doing getting to the right stuff by itself and that means that we really are all in this together so yeah if you want to listen to what i have to say i'll be posting essays on this and other podcasts that i'm doing and other thoughts plus on what uh, our group is going to be working on please go to and subscribe to me at sergefaget.com or on twitter at serge w1 And I guess like we'll have those in the show notes. And Jim, thank you so much for another tremendous episode. I've really, really enjoyed it. And in fact, like learned a few things which are very interesting and important philosophical points by synthesizing your perspective. And I think that this is like one of the truly important things we can learn to do is to synthesize multiple perspectives. Indeed. Real thinking, not simulated thinking, right? Yep. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.